point number eight, Till's favorite questions are, there's two big ones I see pop up all the time. What's a business no one is building? So you think about that. And what's a belief you hold that no one agrees with you on? Very powerful question. And there's a good example, like you can't just say education screwed, for example, because that's pretty true. And pretty much most people will agree with that. What's a really specific thing you believe about education that actually no one else really agrees on? For example, like the whole thing is debunked. All right? If I say, no, no, kindergarten to year 12 and the university system for pretty much most degrees is like pretty much bullshit. Even if you need to qualify people for jobs like being a doctor, the way they're taught is still terrible to actually create good doctors. We've still got massive problems in our healthcare systems. We've got people who can't deviate from a script of a list of symptoms and stuff like that. We've got lots of people dying from medical error. So, if, you know, you hold a contr very contrarian view like that. And then I say that and people message on the podcast saying, that's not really true for this and this reason. You know, how can you say that? I went, I studied this. I had a good experience. And yes, and this is the whole fucking point of Teal. This is why he's gold. Because this is the nature of innovation. This is the opposite of what we have. You need people who see things before everyone else. And for them to have the conviction to actually follow through on implementing that and turning it into bringing it to everyone else. Right? There's always like COVID. COVID starts out, this thing is in Wuhan. So the thing that, you know, the first person to see COVID is like, we've got a whole global pandemic coming, right? And everyone, everyone else is like, nah, that's, that's not going to happen. And we've had things like Ebola and stuff that didn't go worldwide, whatever, swine flu. It's, it, you can pick any example. And th this is the nature of what we need. So this is like what innovation is really about. Point number nine. Oh, yeah. And I guess that's a big, you know, to link things instead of always introducing new concepts. That's very much the without the box thinking example too. All right. We talked about that in episode 136. Number nine. You'll love this one, Luke. Competition is for losers. <laughs> According to Peter Thiel, competition is for losers. And he's, I think he makes the point basically that most people, you know, they create something, but it's not really that different to anything else that has come before. Right? If you're in a category of one, which is you've really, even if it's within, you know, you've got a running podcast, right? I've got, you know, I've got this podcast, right? It, you create your own category within a category. And that's when you really have created something, right? Mm -hmm. You're in your own space where no one can really compete with you compared to the companies that just, he says, there's, you know, companies that just try to say they're really different, but they lock themselves into competitions. So when you don't actually distinguish yourself that much, you just locked into competition and then you spend all your energy actually like fighting against other people because you can't differentiate yourself. All right. You might, you might reflect on this with work and stuff like that. He yeah. gives, gives a big nod. And I see a lot of that, especially when you're selling um, a product that can be seen as a commodity. Exactly. Exactly. And this, this is his point. This is his point. Like it's actually a lot of hard work, but yet those are the safe things to do. Right. You know, like mm. existing industries, like a lawyer, like what's the big difference between this lawyer and that lawyer? You know, normally there's a nuance, there's an individual ability, but a lot of the time they just get business because they've built a relationship pipeline. There's not necessarily like a major difference, but it's interesting, right? Those people are having good careers, maybe they're enjoying their work, they're getting a lot of status and income and everything. But are those people that could actually be innovating? I always find this interesting. We're very happy for people to just get to that point. You know, so this is very interesting. But yeah, so competition, he, he's like, he, he hates this concept of like, you're competing. Like, no, you should create something unique enough that you're not, you essentially get to a point where you're not competing. That is actually really important for innovating, he says. So point number 10 comes to the actual importance of companies and startups. So this is a quote, right? Properly defined, this is from the book, a startup is the largest group of people you can convince of a plan to build a different future. A new company's most important strength is new thinking. Even more important than nimbleness, small size affords space to think. Combine this with the monopoly point. If you don't have to worry about money, you can think. So this is my analysis now, right? When you're worried, and this is what I said about the hamster wheel, I think in the last episode or two episodes ago, 
Like if you don't have to worry about grades all the time and the assessment and the exams coming up, if you don't have to worry about like your bills and your lifestyle, being able to afford things for the wife or the kids or whatever it is in life, or like, you know, I've got to get sales because I'm running out of money next month. Well, you don't have to worry about those things. You're afraid to think about like bigger picture things. And this is the advantage, he says, of companies that have monopolies. Like Google's not worried about money. All right, or Alphabet more accurately, because it's their parent company. You know, they have most of their revenue would be coming from Google ads and stuff like that. But they spend most of their time like coming up with all these crazy inventions that we hardly hear about in Alphabet and stuff. And they're really like innovating. So it's uh it's it's fascinating because again, this is not really in our current education system at all. About like really freeing people up to think of better innovations. Normally people think I'm going to get ahead financially so I can do something, sit on a beach or something like that. But then they actually just spend all their time focusing on making more money. And that's normally, that's normally like, there's a, again, his, his quote, right? Lack of failure of imagination for an alternate future. We get, even if you get to these points, it's like the imagination is very basic that we have. Whereas, you know, there's probably a lot of people who could be moving things forward. And uh, yeah, I think the other thing, this was gold, point number 11. We, considering how we think about the past, he has a very good point around this. And like education, if you think about it, is a very linear model. You're really taught to continue with what has come before, right? So it's one, it's very instructive, right? Teacher at the front or lecturer at the front, disseminating wisdom, very prescriptive. This is what you do, this is what you don't do. Two, there's no concept no concept of without the box thinking. You're not taught history to question the interpretation of history. You're not taught Shakespeare to question the nature of Shakespeare. You're not taught math so you can think about, you know, where, where, what formulas or whatever is to come. The whole thing is like, here's the information you need. And the whole thing is against without the box thinking. It's precisely the opposite. So I'll give you a great example from Till. And this is a quote again from the book. The entrepreneurs who stuck with Silicon Valley, he's referring to after the dot-com crash, learned four big lessons from the dot-com crash that still guide business thinking today. One, making incremental advances. So there's this idea that grand visions inflated the bubble, so they should not be indulged. Anyone who claims to be able to do something great is suspect, and anyone who wants to change the world should be more humble. Small incremental steps are the only safe path forward. Two, Stay lean and flexible. All companies must be lean, which is code for unplanned. You should not know what your business will do. Planning is arrogant and inflexible. Instead, you should try things out. Iterate and treat entrepreneurship as agnostic experimentation. Um, that's maybe a bit Joe Weeby, but there you go. Uh, three, improve on the competition. Don't try to create a new market prematurely. The only way to know what you have a real business, that, that you have a real business is to start with an already existing customer. So you should build your company by improving on recognizable products already offered by successful competitors. Four, focus on product, not sales. If your product requires advertising or salespeople to sell it, it's not good enough. Technology is primarily about product development, not distribution. Bubble era advertising was obviously wasteful, so the only sustainable growth is viral growth. These lessons have become dogma in the startup world. And those who ignore them are presumed to write to invite the justified doom visit, visited upon technology in the great crash of 2000. And yet the opposite principles are, are probably more correct. <laughs> One, it is better to risk boldness than triviality. Two, a bad plan is better than no plan. Three, competitive markets destroy profits. Four, sales matter just as much as product. To build the future, we need to challenge the dogmas that shape our view of the past. That doesn't mean the opposite of what is believed is, is necessarily true. It means that you need to rethink what is and is not true and determine how that shapes how we see the world today. So the, the most contrarian thing of all is not to oppose the crowd, but to think for yourself. You know, so again, I, come, I think Peter Thiel would love without the box thinking, obviously. This is basically what he's describing. And like, it's, just, it's just incredibly powerful. Like it, just, it, it hits me, it's just so true. Um, because that, that's definitely shaped the startup world. It's definitely, I've had friends who go into Silicon Valley to raise money and, and they kind of, you know, they, they lose people because the, the vision's too grand. 
like the whole culture is not really fit for that. It's fit around giving something simple um, and, and realistic. So it's not really truly, and I want to talk about um, startup culture in the next kind of body of the podcast, but yeah. And then I think point number 12 here, rivalry and petty competition force us to copy the past, which is where we come back to that idea of competition. So short term, I think basically what I, creates a lot of short term thinking. Basically, I saw this in real estate because real estate companies are all pretty much exactly the bloody same, right? They sell your house, they advertise on the same websites, they use a signboard, cool. They just have different colors and they're a different agent, right? And, and this, the service is not distinguishable at all, really. People are tossing a bloody contract sometimes, to see which way it lands to decide who they go with. It's a good, it's a good example of a lot of other businesses in the business world because there's so much short-term thinking in real estate. That's why it's such a notorious industry because there's so many people backstabbing and everything like that. So it's because, because you're trying to get results on a, on a shorter time frame because you're having to compete so much. So it's a, it's a fascinating, yeah. So that's, that's like big takeaways from zero to one. So you can see, I think the takeaway for me, there's a lot of gold in there and it's a great book, but the takeaway from there is that don't rely on the systems that have educated you to turn you into an innovator, number one. And two, don't settle for being like a muggle or a semi-innovator. Like be, be open. Like you, you can think way more freely than the, the, the space you've been given to think freely up now, right? Like you can do things. I think if you actually, it starts really with just being able to giving yourself permission to think more broadly and to be able to have a belief and idea and actually stand up for it, to be honest. Mm. Um, the, did they give any examples of some visions that were too grand, for example, that just didn't stick? Was there anything you can think of? No, like there's, there's not really that specifically because okay. there's, there's a lot of, but you think about the investment infrastructure and I was at a lunch once, not to, not, certainly not picking on anyone here. I was at a lunch and there was a lot of investors. And, you know, I had to, they said, what do you do going around saying, what do you do? And I explained constant student. I tried to, I think I butchered it, but you know, the constant student thing's like a bigger, you know, often more said to be more intangible product, like community, young people doing all these different things. And so it's, it, it, yeah, admittedly, like it's can be hard to describe, but then you talk about um, Scott, right. And espresso displays, right. He's other, his main company. And, and it's like, oh, that's cool. You know, what's the display? Oh yeah, it does this and this. And these are these like angel, these are startup investors. These are mm. people who own and have run like technology companies and stuff like that. And so you got this tangible, tangible and simple is easier for people to grasp. Big and lofty and big dream. That's not necessarily all like specific boxed up, simple. Mm. It's not a criticism on Scott uh, on displays, espresso displays. It's just the nature of that versus something. Yeah, that has a, no, that makes sense. Does that, does that make sense? Like yeah. the whole, you know, landscape around if you want to get funding how are you going to get funding how you get customers if people don't understand it for, for example yeah. so that's why some there are you know advantages and, and disadvantages and so you know the, the 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 advice i get most often is don't think so big <laughs> <laughs> and i go yes in some senses drip it out a bit more but deep down i'll never never stop no way because this is the point. This is why they're not trying to do it. Yeah. Because they don't think that way. Mm. That's yeah. two, two pretty good examples of yes. what they're representing to those points. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, don't, don't think, because like what the risk of doing something trivial to me is way greater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is his point. Like that's, that's the stupider thing to do. That's mm. the stupider thing to do is do something trivial that you consider trivial. You know, you can't let anyone tell you what is and is not trivial. Decide it for yourself. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, you know, zero to one. And we'll, yeah, keep going. We'll finish off Peter Thiel tomorrow with the last in this series.